Welcome everyone to our December recording for the Health Systems in Transitions uh, Stewardship Labs. I'm Ella Auchincloss and I'm here with Peja Stoichich, as you know, and we have the <clears throat> just the wonderful opportunity to introduce a guest that we've really been uh, looking forward to, to speaking with. I'm happy to introduce uh, Stan McChrystal. He is a retired general of the US Army. He's been described as one of America's greatest warriors and is widely praised for launching a, revolutionary, a revolution in warfare by leading a comprehensive counterterrorism organization that fused intelligence with operations and really changed the way that the military and the government interact. We will include the details of his bio um, in the course packet that we give you. But I wanna say that Rethink Health and the Ripple Foundation, Stan, we have a tradition of inviting people outside of the domain of health and healthcare to impart their wisdom on how we can do the hard work of system change. We've spoken with people in politics and pe people from energy, people from you know, kind of straight up management schools, but never have we had the honor of speaking to someone who has served our country um, with such uh, valor and glory. So thank you. I'd like to start by just uh, again, wel welcoming you and asking you Stan, if you could just tell us first how you became aware that the tools um, that you were employing when you were facing uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, how you felt that they were no longer fit for purpose. Ella, thank you. And Pedrick, thank you for having me and, and for what you're doing, because the healthcare industry uh, touches all of us. Yeah. And it matters so much that so the ability to, uh, to make this kind of change is critical. You know, we use the term complex adaptive system. What I would say is you don't get to choose complex. <laughs> complex is something that happens to you. Right, right. Um, whether you adapt is your choice, and it often makes the difference whether you're successful or not. You kindly described uh, that I had been involved in a revolution in military affairs. And if we go back, I would say, when do people execute a revolution? When they feel they have to. You think about the United States did a revolution because they thought they couldn't live under Great Britain's rules anymore. And then the French did the storied French Revolution when they felt that life under the French monarchy was just intolerable. So they did a revolution. And that's my way of getting to the point of why I was part of a revolution in military affairs. And the answer is because we had to. I would love to say that we were just great thinkers who stepped back and decided that a revolution would, would take us to a new place. But the answer is we were losing. And let me explain how that happened. In 1980, the United States conducted a rescue attempt in Iran, famously yeah. known as Operation yeah. Eagle Claw. Mm -hmm. And the United States military was still sort of coming out of the hangover from the Vietnam War. And what had happened was many of the things in Vietnam had, had been very painful and the military was not in a good shape in the 1970s. There were still some really uh, talented veterans from the war. But when 1980 came, actually November 1979, an Iranian student seized Americans in the American mm -hmm. embassy in Tehran. Right. They caught America at a weak point in our defense and a particular weak point in our ability to do that kind of operation, a mm -hmm. special operation that we see in movies and TV nowadays. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so the effort was to put together an operation to rescue uh, more than 50 American citizens held at two locations in downtown Tehran, the capital of a country that was denied to the United States entirely. So a complicated plan was put together. Professionals were gathered. They were forged into this uh, operation that involved a number of moving pieces, all of which depended upon the success of another moving piece. Mm -hmm. And it failed. And it failed very famously and very publicly with eight Americans killed, wrecked American equipment left in the desert and President right. Carter apologizing right. basically yeah. right. for the failure. In the 
in the aftermath of that, inside the government, but particularly the military, the decision was made never again. We'll never be caught in that position where we can't do that kind of operation. You remember in 1976, Israeli commanders had gone to Entebbe and very right. famously rescued their citizens. 1980, the United States fails fecklessly, it looks like. Yeah. But when they, when they studied the operation, they didn't find incompetence or a lack of courage or a lack of a detailed plan. What they found was Navy helicopters flown by Marine Corps pilots linking up with Air Force cargo planes carrying Army commandos, and the four groups had not worked together before. So right. while they tried to put them into this very cohesive team, there just wasn't time. And so it fell apart at the connections. And they made the decision in the aftermath to form an organization, ultimately known as Joint Special Operations Command, to be purpose-built for these kinds of operations in the future. Counter so hijacking. Cross-sector collaboration, which is very much a challenge that's faced by, by yeah, the true. leaders we're working with. Right. And was the first response to the challenge, you know, still uh, is a response how to how to address that challenge. So yeah. That's exactly. And so this this organization was created to be able to do counter hijacking hostage rescue, very elegantly, precisely executed operations. And it was founded formally in 1981. And for 22 years, it performed that just extraordinarily well in a number of real world operations and then countless training is. And I grew up in that organization. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge was it was purpose built for an environment in which terrorist organizations were essentially pyramid shaped hierarchies. And you don't think of them that way, but that's the way they were, a strong founder, tight discipline processes to survive. Right. And so this very specialized counter-terrorist force was really well suited to dealing with those. And that's what we did. We would perform these extraordinarily uh, well thought through operations, but we didn't have to do it very often. So you could plan, you could rehearse, you could get it all together, line it up and execute it and come back and, and feel good about it. And so all that was great until 2003. You remember 9-11 in 2001 mm -hmm. and Al Qaeda was one of those pyramid shaped traditional hierarchies. They did the attacks on the World Trade Towers, but then they couldn't follow it up because they weren't adaptive themselves enough to do that. But in 2003, a new organization emerged, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It wasn't originally called that. It had a different name. It was under a young Jordanian named Abu Sabah al zarqawi But this new entity emerged that took the Al-Qaeda in Iraq moniker, and they were completely different. They operated on information technology and a different mindset, a different operational construct. They were very fluid. They didn't follow set discipline processes. They were very adaptable. They were wickedly fast and they learned constantly. And so as a consequence, they were, they were uh, able to outrun us, outchange us. And they were very resilient because no matter where we hit them, mm. if we tried to take out Mr. or Mrs. Big, even if you got them, it didn't have the same effect that it had in traditional organizations because things were more fluid. It's self-corrected almost right. automatically much more network, more of a network than a hierarchical organization. Completely. I, I love the way you tell the story in your book, by the way, mm. in Team of Teams. Um, and I will talk more about that and when, we, uh, when we have our actual session, but yeah. So, so I love how you said that complexity didn't choose, that you didn't choose complexity, it chose you. I think that's very, very mm -hmm. apt. But um, I know from our work that there's no set, there's no like textbook around how you deal with complex systems and yet, and, you know, and management structures and management schools up until very, very recently, I mean, like very recently are still teaching in environments that we would characterize as complicated, not complex. So because it's still such an uh, unstable molecule from an information standpoint, who were your sources of wisdom on this? Yeah, and I'm going to admit, we iterated to it. We didn't read the yeah. doctrine. 
about two yeah. years into it, we read the book, The Starfish and the Spider. Uh-huh. Yeah. But the pamphlet. And and we, but we were already doing it. What we found was we were simply adapting to what we needed to do that would work. Yeah. You know, we used to say if it's stupid and it works, it ain't stupid. So try <laughs> everything. How difficult was to adjust the organization that is used to kind of like command, command and control structure to this like save to fail experiments, you know, or experiments at, at all, uh, because that's a big challenge that some of our hospital leaders are facing uh, constantly. Yeah. That may be one of the most key challenges because we were not fit for purpose because Al Qaeda in Iraq was different. And yet there was a desire inside the organization to figure out what they were and then reshape ourselves to fix that. Essentially to go from being one kind of complicated organization to another kind of complicated organization for that new problem. But what we realized is they were constantly changing. It wasn't even intentional on their part, it was organic. And so what we had to become was something that constantly changed. Now that was very disorienting to us because oh, in the military, you want to set up a structure and then perfect it. Yeah. yeah, that kind of process really matters. Yeah, so, I mean, so this is why your story gives us so much hope. If if the U.S. military can do it. <laughs> that's exactly, if I can do it. There's no right hell can do it, right? I mean, that's what we've got, that's what we're really hoping for here. So we're trying to really, you know, I know you had a, you had a lot of authority and you had the, you know, the wisdom sort of started at the top around this, um, but you built learning systems in. So how did you build the learning system in? How did you bake it into the work? Yeah, and this is, it's interesting you use that, Ella, because I know in healthcare, people say, well, General McChrystal was a commander. He had authority. Well, in reality, it's not quite like that. In the military, you've got all these bosses, and I had six different bosses. I had these forces you know, outside pushing and pulling forces, trying to limit what we could do. And then inside my force, I had a bunch of very self-confident, very professional, very accomplished people. Sound familiar in the healthcare world? Yep. And they all had a strong opinion. And if you moved things, if you changed things, you the first feeling was you were undercutting their expertise or their equities because they'd spent a lifetime becoming the best commanders in the world. I used to tell them, it's like being a Super Bowl winning football team, and this year we're gonna play basketball. Nobody's <laughs> excited, not their area. Back. So for us to change, we, we had the help of the equivalent of a burning platform. We were losing. So we yeah. had reason to change. We had yeah. no roadmap and no yeah. cultural habit of adaptation. Okay, so it starts with this urgent story of now, right? The story of now here is we're losing. Um, our old way of work no longer suits the current situation that we face. Again, lots of similarities with the um, situation that we find ourselves in. But there is, it doesn't feel, I mean, I know that there are financial strains. Certainly the pandemic is revealing all kinds of uh, really critical fissures in the system. But I don't think that people are feeling the, the platform is burning quite just yet. But you did, and you orchestrated a very significant internal change. So how did you overcome, let's just start with the, the barriers of hierarchy and thick organizational lines. How did you overcome that? Apart from yeah. having a burning platform. Yeah. If you start with the organizational resistance to change, the organizations yeah. we had inside were each very cohesive, strong cultures internally, like Delta Force, the Rangers, the yes. SEALs. Mm -hmm. And they didn't play well with others because an insular tribal entity rarely does. And then you have some outside equities, the intelligence community, aviation, all of whom yeah. want to work a certain way. So people put in places, they say, I will cooperate as long as it's following oh, these rules. And when you put all that together, you get very clunky systems. And in some cases, people have lived with those systems because they kind of worked. You know, you, you could make them work well enough to get by. 
what we found is those organizational equities and habits and all had to be bulldozed. We, we had to, as a commander internally, I had the ability to, to topple some of those and then create a need for the others. And then the other part is the individual part, the individual hesitation. Mm-hmm. Indi- people don't share information. People don't want to change the way they do things, that sort of thing. And there were individual equities too. There were, where do I stand in the organization? Do I know and trust those people? We didn't have a history of information sharing because there was this backdrop of security and what's secret. But the real reason is information's power. Information is, it's my habit. That, that, those, that was the real challenge with that. Can I, can I ask a, a question? Something that is really interesting for me. So you were describing a story where previously the cooperation between those different silos and entities was almost outsourced to this agency that was there to make the connections. And now all of a sudden you have to teach every single piece to actually do it on, it, on its own without the, without the entity, without what we call in our world backbone organization. And there's this kind of like history in healthcare, especially when it comes to addressing social determinants of health, like, oh, we're going to get together. We're going to have a backbone organization. That function will help us break the silos. But you're saying something differently. To break, really break the silos, you need to teach every single entity to do the work differently. Is that right? Is that a... Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Suppose you are going to put on your daughter's wedding. And so you hire a wedding planner who makes a lot of money because they're the person you talk to. And then they talk to people and they set up contracts and processes and all this. And then a week before the wedding, the pandemic hits and you got to change everything. And the wedding planners, you know, working from home and maybe they're not that good anyway. And suddenly you realize you got to deal with caterers and, and uh, musicians and photographers and all and guests. And you just start connecting with everybody and you start saying you talk to them because you're going to have to figure out boom 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 you talk to them suddenly things happen faster more organically more effectively but they are frightening to the participants initially because they're not working through the the very comfortable formal process Mm -hmm. and i would argue in a complex environment there's not time to do that that's really true so you describe in your book team of teams um the experience of putting together these um, these nodes from these other military networks together to work on the same team and and um, I don't remember what you called it but this idea of bringing your best putting your best person taking the best person from a team and um, relocating them into another team so that um, you were demonstrating that the best of the best got to play this cross collaborative role can you just say a little bit more about how that worked and um, yeah, just sort of w- w- how you fumbled first and then how you made it work. Yeah, at first we started with just exchanges internal to the command where we take somebody from the SEALs and put them in Delta Force for four months and vice versa. And there was huge resistance to this because nobody wants to go have to be in another tribe for four months because you don't know them, you don't like them and they're different and dangerous. Right. But once they've been there for a while, they realize everybody's the same and they respect them and they come home and they tell their buddies, you know, they're really a lot like us. So we did that initially, and that was internal. But then we needed to be networked around the battlefield with all the conventional forces, with all the embassies, with the Department of State, with CIA headquarters. We had to be at 76 different locations with liaison teams, people. Now, if you think about a liaison, that's somebody you send from your organization to go connect with another. And in the military, the history is you send the people you want to get rid of because get them out of sight, out of mind. Ella, you'd send Stan because you go, he's no value here, so I might as well send him. Um, and you don't want to send Pedro because- I'm just wondering if I've sh- ever seen that person, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so as a consequence, when these very mediocre talents show up to the people you're trying to connect with, they don't do too good a job because they're not that effective. And so the connection's not that good. So what we did was we changed the model. We said, we're going to send our best people to be liaisons. Now, they didn't want to be liaisons because they're a pilot or a commando or or something. And it wasn't always, it didn't equate to whether they were good in their other job. It equated personality type and intelligence. Could they work with people? But we send these people out and they 
built these incredibly strong relationships. So pretty soon we have this extraordinary network. A lot of times, if you're talking between two embassies in the region, we became the conduit between ambassadors. What, you know, wait a minute, a counter-terrorist force is helping Ambassador A talk with Ambassador C. Right. Well, it was the quickest, easiest way. And those people, that was the one part of the command that I personally micromanaged. I had this yeah. big spreadsheet and I would say, okay, Ella, you're going to send Pejic out as a liaison. And you go, no, 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 I want to send Stan. And I said, I know. The mere fact you want to send Stan means I don't want him. Give me Pejic. <laughs> um, but then we had, to, we had to make sure that it was good for his career. We made it good for his career, what he learned it. But we learned that, and I used to always use this analogy. I said, team, when we started this war, we're like Amazon.com, the booksellers. We right. became Amazon.com, the network that could sell anything. And the essential strength was in the dynamic of our network. It wasn't the shooting or the flying or the task. It was the network that we could create synergy. Right, which is such a beautiful segue to the next, um, the next set of questions that we have for you around how you design work in complex adaptive systems. And you talk about those synergies and you talk in your book about building a network. Um, and, you, and you also talk a lot about simple rules. And we have been talking a lot in our projects about the idea of simple rules, using simple rules to drive strategy. And I'm wondering if you could just share with us now how you know, you talk about those synergies. How did you use, what were your strategy and tactics for empowering people to make decisions at those, in those areas where the decisions mattered most, like right, yeah. like locally where it mattered the most? Yeah, you really drilled onto what's important and, and simple rules are key. And so you, we started with the idea that well, when I took command, I found there were all kinds of rules that had been put in place, very detailed prescriptions and prohibitions that were usually based on some experience. Or so someone had said, because that went wrong this time in the future, we'll never do this or that. Mm -hmm. And it became a set of excuses not to do things because mm -hmm. in fact, you have all these reasons you couldn't do something and, and good intention people just are handcuffed. So I said, okay, we only have two rules now. It can't be illegal and it can't be immoral. And I want you to do it. Don't worry about any other rules. Certain people go great and they run with it. Certain people have to sort of be trained. They've been, you know, like the dog in the electric collar after a while, you know, they just automatically don't the try. Yeah. yeah, you have to build them. So you start with that very simple rule. And then, and underlying that rule is, but you will accomplish the mission. I don't want to hear about you not accomplishing. I don't care what it costs. I don't care about boom, boom, you will accomplish it. And so that changed people's mindset. They went to being mission focused and not just doing a task, a specific task. And, and they took more responsibility because of that. Then we put some other rules that we learned over time. And so rules, around was, purpose, rules around purpose, just to yeah. those rules. So rules around a very clear sense of the, the shared purpose, the mission orientation. What, what are we trying to do here? Yeah. You know, and, and we kept saying we're, and I, I always was trying to pull out little pithy sayings. And I said, we're not here to fight the war on terror. We're here to win the war on terror. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with a number of things. We found that it was partnership with other elements like Department of State, like CIA and all, and your, and your host nation partners that really enabled or hindered your success. So we used to say that everything you do has got to be decided to preserve the relationship. So for example, if we could do an operation, but an ambassador in a country didn't want us to do that operation, we could bulldoze over and we could get support from DC and we could win that argument. But the problem is you build up scar tissue that hurts long-term. So we always said every decision we make is looking toward the next decision we need. So at all costs, preserve the relationship. And that that changes the way you think. The second thing is we said, for us to be effective, we have to be 
given freedom of action. The command needs to be able to do things that the command never could do before. And we didn't need people micromanaging. So we came out with a mathematical equation and we said, freedom of action comes from credibility. If people assign you great credibility, you have freedom of action. And that credibility equals competence plus integrity plus relationships. You have to be proven competent. You have to always be honest and you've got to maintain relationships. If you do those three things, we will be judged credibly. We'll be given freedom of action. We'll be able to get our job done. And we would review that at least once a week with the entire command because that became rules. You know, mm -hmm. it, it embedded in that are just really simple but straightforward things. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, protect and build our credibility. And what about those rules that you empowered the special forces on the ground to follow where they didn't have to, if they saw an opportunity, they had the authority to drive the action at the point where it's happening. Yeah. Um, and what we'd say is you not only have the authority, you have the expectation, you have the responsibility to act. Don't come to me for approval for something. If it falls within what are we trying to do? What's our mission? And it's not illegal or immoral. Do it right. and do it now and then tell us about it. Right, right. So it was really, really simple. But I just want to make one comment that is interesting. You said competence, integrity, and relationships. I could easily envision competence, integrity being important in military. Relationships, especially in the hierarchical structures, like a little less so. How did you, how did you assess yeah. that in the, in the context of your work? Yeah, and those relationships are two level, Pedrick. They're individual and they're organizational, and the two overlap. Uh -huh. if, if someone doesn't like you, if you are a jerk, they may do what you want, but they'll, you'll, they'll only do the minimum. They'll do the absolute limit of what they have to do. If they trust and like you, they'll do a heck of a lot more. If they think it's in their interest to have a good relationship with you, they will do an awful lot more. Organizations are the same way organizations just respond to what individuals do. And so organizations will either go more than halfway or much less than halfway based upon building that. So we were always trying to, to build up the, the sinew that when it gets painful, you mm -hmm. can fall back on. There's a great story of, of a guy in, in the command who used to empty trash cans when we first put him in an embassy. He was a Navy SEAL, very accomplished guy. When we assigned him to the Love yeah, story. Tell me yeah that we story. assigned him to the embassy in Yemen. And for the first probably a month, every afternoon, he emptied trash cans. By the time he left, he was one of the most trusted members for the ambassador and the chief of state, the CIA's chief of station. He was in their inner circle. But for the mm -hmm. first month, literally, they, they shunned him until he just did little things and he built up credibility and relationships. Yeah. Now, most people wouldn't have the, the modesty or humility to do that. Yeah. But he just did exactly what we wanted. He embodied it. Yeah. It takes a lot of courage and resilience to do something like that and, yeah. and, and actually practice that. That's, that's amazing. So I'm curious, Stan, if you could just share a little bit more. So, all right. So you wanted to free people up to empower people. So they had a much stronger sense of shared purpose. You wanted to empower them to make decisions at the point that they were making them. So that's a learning process, right? You didn't just, that wasn't a bolt from the blue that you tried and succeeded at day one, right? So how did you build that learning cycle into your work? How did you figure out that those were the rules that you needed to build? What I'm trying to get at is, can you share how you iterated in this setting? Sure. Um and it may not be the only way to get this, but how we did. Uh, special operations is an interesting community because most people are 35 to 50 years old. So they're not young soldiers. There's an immense amount of respect between people and you have to show that kind of respect. When I took command, the commanding general, me, was, per was personally approving every operation. And you know, they'd come up with this concept in a few PowerPoint slides and they'd pitch it and then I'd approve it or disprove it. 
But the reality is they were more experienced in what they're going to do on that operation than I was. And mm -hmm. particularly as war went on, and some of these guys have been on hundreds of raids. What am I going to tell them about how to do their business? What I can tell them is how we're going to win the war, the big strategic part. Mm -hmm. So I just stopped trying to tell them how to do their business. It was, it was sort of a kabuki to go through that anyway. You know, mm -hmm. I'd sit there and sagely nod, but, but I wasn't really very helpful to them. So what I was able to do is turn around and say, I trust you. So I want you to do what we got to do to achieve this end state. Now, there are going to be missteps. There are going to be mistakes. There are going to be times when we have very public failures. But I can live with that. And I've got to learn to live with that to speed them up, to, to make them feel more comfortable. My, my admonition to them or my guidance to them is always, don't be cavalier about this. This is serious stuff. And they weren't. But, but the, the only way it says, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. I'm just going to tell you in the framework of this, we got to we got to live to these morals with this legal stuff. And we're not going to be casual with the life, lives of our people. But other than that, let's make it happen and let's go fast. I was wondering, was there a moment where you were feeling the surge to go back in and, and maybe, you know, you're seeing them kind of like doing something yeah. and you know it's important for them to do but you kind of like feel like, Mayo, maybe I should step in. <laughs> and how did that make you feel? Because that's the tension that, that, that all of our leaders are experiencing. Right now. There are two impulses to do that. The first impulse is many leaders in healthcare were physicians and whatever. And so there's this desire to do that, which is in your comfort zone. So to reach down and tell people how to, to do something. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's that. Uh, and But the other is to feel like you're important. And, and I'm not saying it's just big ego. Everybody wants to feel essential to the organization. I don't know any of us who don't inwardly feel really good when someone comes to us and says, oh, great woman or man, give us your guidance on this. And you kind of go, this is so tiresome, but you love being asked because you're needed. Yeah. And what I was essentially doing is putting myself in a place where for much of what they were doing, I wasn't needed. And so you have to deal with that dynamic. And then the other dynamic is you're still responsible. So when this thing goes horribly wrong and your bosses are calling, I had this happen a number of times, are calling and, and telling me what this colossal screw up we've done is, I can't go, well, my people, they're horrible. I own it. So high degree of personal responsibility. Yeah, exactly. Great deal of support. So we're seeing personal responsibility, deep commitment to your people, deeply, deeply, just a, a real deep commitment to learning and a deep sense of shared purpose. Which, mm -hmm. um, so we talk a lot about, so in our work with, um, with, these, with these hospital systems and in some of the other work we do, we talk a lot about um, intentional, what we call intentional interdependence and helping people understand that, um, you know, if we exist in an ecosystem, which we do, that's not an if, um, we are in some form of interdependent relationship with the other people in our network. And so our role if we want to pursue a network strategy, say around improving the health of a, of, of a community, um, our role is to be much more intentional about that interdependence. And I know that you talked a lot about that in teams, team of teams, and I'm wondering if you can share more about how you teach intentional interdependence um, and, and what would you say to let me just back, the backdrop of all of these questions for us is that, you know, we're working in a sector that where society is beginning to expect the, more from them. So if they have to go out and build new partnerships, show up in communities in very, very different ways, how can they be who they are, but me, be much more intentional about surviving in a network of other stakeholders that are there intending to produce health and well-being in their community? Yeah. Well, I think the key thing is interdependence, it's not a negative, it's a positive. Yeah. We sometimes use the word dependency as a negative. We're dependent mm -hmm. upon a drug or something. And okay, that, that cannot be good. 
but being dependent upon other people is actually a very positive thing. And so you start to build trust. That dependency means you start to think about your relationship with people. You start to respect them because you need them. Um, I think in the military environment, what we found was many people had played sports. Good sports teams have this intuitively arrived at interdependence. A football team can't do what it does unless everybody does their job to some acceptable level. And that's true in most sports. There are a few cases where you have superstars where they sort of aren't team players and you start to see a negative dynamic, no matter how good they are. Mm -hmm. They're actually as bad for the team as they are potentially good for the team because the interdependency isn't accepted. It's mm -hmm. uh, resisted. In the counterterrorism fight, initially we didn't have accepted interdependence. For example, our counterterrorist forces considered themselves like really, really specialist surgeons or maybe the plumber who comes to your house who isn't going to do any of the prep. It's just going to go in and do one or two little things because they're the only people in the world can do that thing. And then they kind of walk away, leave the mess, and they go, my work here is done. Yeah, the realm of best practice, the realm of the expert. Yeah. And what you really need is a completely opposite approach. The problem is X, and we as a team have got to be accept joint responsibility. I spent much of last winter in the hospital, in the ICU, and hmm. I'd studied healthcare, but it was funny because in the best instances, there was a team. The surgeon was doing as everybody's connected. Hmm. When it wasn't working, somebody would come in and they'd, they'd have to either look at me or administer some kind of drug. And they go, so what is your problem? What are we doing here? Why are we doing that? And, and I become the integrator of my medical care. And I go, the, the sick patient is the integrator. Yeah, yeah. I'm the uh, least qualified person here. I am interested. <laughs> and, and, and usually they don't trust you. That's, a, that's another problem. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it gets to this idea that this interdependency, which means they have to have a shared outcome. They have to believe that the outcome is what they're all measured on. That mm -hmm. it's not whether you did the operation right. It's not whether the drug was done right. It's whether the patient has the outcome that you wanted them to have. For us in the fight, we got more interdependent with the CIA, National Security Agency, because none of us could win it alone. We, we learned pretty quickly. We all had to have each other's if we were going to get an outcome. And, but it didn't come quickly. I mean, it was resistance all, you know, every step of the way. But you you stuck you stuck with it, and um, it's probably now. Would you say now it's you know it's become normalized, right? In in the way that you train your leaders now. Well, in that part of the military, this that special operations unit, it's pretty normalized. But I would tell you that, and the relationships are stronger than they certainly were before. But when the crisis subsides when we're not fighting as hard now as we were in Iraq or Afghanistan, people go back to their corners, they go back to their offices, they go back to their tribes. And so they think that there is this great synergy, but the reality is it wanes over time. Probably 80%, 85% of the army has never been in combat now because it turns over so fast, nature of the yes. force. Yeah. Right. And you gotta realize how quick those, those uh, relationships you build can go away if you don't maintain them. Yeah, it's like a democracy. You know, you have to revive it to, to survive. Uh, exactly. And, can I ask yeah. a question? In, in your book, you talk a little bit about, well, not a little bit, there's, there's a whole chapter about seeing each other, like, like a new way, new transparency that organizations that were working together were achieving. And, and I think part of that story was kind of like sending the best people, which I think it's a, it's a marvelous strategy. Was there any other, because we, we've been starting to explore that, to actually make the case that seeing each other plumbing, as Ella would say, uh, between the two organizations is actually really critical for them to start working together in the same direction. So what else did you do aside from kind of like sending people to be, to be immersed in the organization? Were there any other things that you did to create that transparency? We, we did, Patrick, and, and I would argue that Transparency is, for the most part, 
the best thing you can do. But there's a hesitation. One, think mm -hmm. about it. Nobody wants to air their dirty laundry to other people, show their limitations and, and whatnot. But in our organization, what we found was our tradition was to be very insular. Even inside our organizations, they were insular. And then our organization, Joint Special Operations Command, was very insular. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't share information with the outside you know, conventional forces or others. And part of that is we didn't want them to see how it operated because it wasn't perfect. And mm -hmm. part of that is they just weren't as good as us because they weren't us, you know, because they just weren't born of our parents. <laughs> um, but but what happens is you you give a false sense of what you can do and what you are doing. And so people often will will have a skewed vision of what they should be doing with you and how organizations can interact, what the shortcomings are. What we did was we started with breaking down the walls. We used to not let conventional forces know what JSOC was doing. We brought them all in and included them in our command center. They put liaisons in us. Plus mm -hmm. we shared amazing amounts of information out that we never would have before. And even though it was top secret stuff, it was critical to do that, how we operated and whatnot. Then every day we did this video teleconference, which was described in the book. Yeah, I was gonna with ask the, you about that. Tell us about that. That was the entire command on a single video teleconference, about 7,500 people every day for 90 minutes. Oh. And you know, <laughs> at first you think that is just, that's meeting madness. But what it was, was not a decision-making meeting like a briefing to the boss. It was this conversation across the command, very structured, but very fast moving, very uh, focused on key things. And it informed everybody what was going on. It was, it was like watching really good TV news for 30 minutes and saying, okay, I know the big things that are happening in the world. If I need to know more, I can go online and find out. But everything that's really important, I've now... I'm aware of. Um, that was the, the goal of it. But what happened from it was even more powerful than that. The first thing was people were informed. We call it shared consciousness. But then we connected people that never had been connected. These 7,500 people are all hearing the same thing at the same time. And they're on 15 chat rooms, which we ran simultaneously. They're chatting across, everybody's on their laptops. So they, they're reaching out to Ella, tell me about X, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. They're establishing relationships and empathy for organizations and people that before they only hazily knew about. But mm -hmm. now they hear you brief what you're doing and they go, wow, I didn't know they were doing that. I need to ask her more about that. Mm -hmm. and, and you start to build this, this level of interaction and communication that was many times more than anything we'd ever done before. And much more than you can do if you go up change of command to the top and then go yeah. down. That, that, that was exactly my question. So what you're saying is it's not just like one layer of leadership that was on this call, but multiple layers of multiple organizations communicating with each other simultaneously. That's really powerful. I mean, what yeah. if, what if a, a community took the health of their people as seriously as that and convened in that way it is sort of our audience, right? Our mm -hmm. audience, health system leaders, as we explained when we um, first contacted you, um, all of them are really trying to grapple with what does it mean to be, you know, this behemoth partner in relationship with these smaller partners in communities. So they, they, they hold a lot of power. They certainly hold a lot of prestige, right? Um, um, but as I said before, society is starting to expect more and more of how they show up and how they participate in, in you know, really serious issues around uh, equity of access, equity of care. Um, so what do you think, based on your work now in the private sector, what have you, what have you observed is the biggest barrier towards um, health systems to make this move to develop a deeper understanding of complex systems. And I mean, if you had a magic wand, you know, what, what would you suggest that leaders do to practice this kind of adaptive leadership that you learned how to do on, yeah. on the job as it were? Sure. If you go to the macro level, you've got to define what it is, the, 
the mission or the objectives actually are. And there are some that are in tension. There's no doubt about it. So if we were to say, okay, the mission is a healthier population of any, let's say a geographic area, we're going to increase the health of the people in a geographic area. And if everybody can be aligned on that overall objective, realistically, not just theoretically. And when I say theoretically, if you asked everybody, do you want the, the, uh, the health of everyone in Minnesota to be better? Everybody go, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But right. then you step back and you say, okay, if that means fewer people are in hospital beds for fewer days, if that means there is less elective surgery, if that means there are fewer pharmaceuticals needed because you've done preventive care, you've done things from birth out, then suddenly you start to push and pull against people's equities. If physicians are on a fee-for-service basis, then, then there's a question about that. If all the people that work with them are also on a provider basis, people providing equipment and, and those sort of things, pharmaceutical makers and, and sellers, everybody is affected by those. And what we really find is, although we think we're aligned on an overall outcome, once we start to pull down, we're not aligned on that at all. Because right. we I have, think that's absolutely the case, right? It's, so yeah. well, the leadership move that we're trying to inspire is how do we create a movement, right? Where more and more, because nobody, nobody went to medical school or, or you know, hospital administration school or whatever to participate in a system that is driving such poor outcomes, right? Nobody did that, <laughs> Every, you know? So how do we create a movement where people start to understand um, how to store it differently, right? I mean, sort of to reach the, you know, you had the platform, we were losing, we, you know, you, we had a burning platform um, and you, so you had, you had the urgency to move you quickly into this space. We've got a little bit, we're, we're working in, yeah. It's not like that, right? So yeah. how do we, how, so we're trying to inspire that for leaders. So I'm just curious. Right. I mean, I'm going to step back just a second and compare it to the counter-terrorist fight. You could argue that had we kept the traditional approach, that counter-terrorist mm -hmm. fight against Al-Qaeda in Iraq would have lasted forever. And hmm. people would be getting promoted and getting medals and some would be getting killed, but those who didn't get killed, you know, there's some positives. There's, I mean, there's, yeah. there's some commercial equities for military people to be in a fight like that for a long, long time. Um, and that's being brutally honest. In the healthcare system, you've got these overall lofty goals, but they're not really connected to realistic objectives. And those realistic objectives are not aligned uh, yeah. for each other. You've got to go back and you've got to say, and you've got to align incentives, organizational incentives and individual incentives to that outcome. Yeah. It, as yeah. you say, it's not bad people, right? But, but people are misaligned because that's the way the system is. That's it, yeah. And that's yeah. why it's so funny. I, I deal with healthcare people all the time and they will stand there and they'll head nod. They go, yeah, this is crazy. Hmm. And you're gonna change, they go, well, you know, just not in a position to change it. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, well, that's the world we're in. I assume there were moments where you had to orchestrate negotiations because between those different entities. Uh, you know, what was the role of negotiations? Because that's what we are seeing more and more is this multi-party kind of like negotiation processes that are messy and you know, like, I'm just curious about what your experience with that, uh, you know, and how did you perform that? Magic, we were in constant negotiation and part of what my liaisons around the region did. So, for example, if you think of the conflicting perspectives of the Department of State and the Central Intelligence Agency and the military, for example, there will be a terrorist operating in an area. The the Department of State doesn't, the ambassador doesn't love that terrorist, but they don't want a big military operation in the country they're working with because that creates all kinds of other problems, et cetera. The CIA wants to build an intelligence apparatus and they'd rather follow the terrorist in, in some cases, not every case, because they collect intelligence and, 
you know, they just keep building their knowledge, which is the core mission. The military is much more apt to want to go get somebody because we're not paid for the long-term diplomatic view, nor are we worried about building long-term intelligence apparatus. Mm. We're trying to solve the problem. So we want to go cut the cancer out today. Mm-hmm. And those are intention. And, and then there are many others that, that add to that. So when you have tension like that between different, it's a constant negotiation. And this mm. gets to what, when we talked earlier about the importance of relationships, because you're not just negotiating today, you negotiate next week on another issue. Hmm. And so we found that the art of us negotiating between organizations was building up a sense that people were invested in the relationship, both sides, so that people would give when you needed them to because they wanted to maintain the relationship. And so suddenly everybody becomes much more malleable when you need them to be because that relationship is so important. Think about a marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to win all the arguments with your spouse because you then you lose your marriage. (laughs) I know that for sure. (laughs) (laughs) I never won one, so I wouldn't know, but you know. Same thing here, like, you know, I'm always losing intentionally. (laughs) I'm a big winner. winner. (laughs) That's why I'm still married, you know, like that. No, but this is really interesting, this idea of kind of like constant negotiations and how the, the, the relational infrastructure is actually critical uh, critical uh, thing for to achieve that. Like without that relation infrastructure, you cannot even have uh, 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 an ongoing negotiations that is changing constantly. That, that is really powerful in the memories. Yeah. There's a little You're bit of- set up for negotiation. What's that? I said you were you basically are organized for negotiation yes. all, the all the time. Right. Yeah. And if you're organized for negotiation, then you're organized for you have to organize relationally. If you're saying that relationships preclude negotiation, which is why we think that if hospital systems are super serious about this, they need to go to community organizing school and learn how community organizers build relationships out in community and and tend to those relationships like a gardener would. Yeah. So I know I love the analogy. So I'm wondering, you're not going to escape this interview without talking about leader as gardener and how that image um, drove your leadership story um, as a as a military person. Yeah. Well, first off, I grew up as a command and control person because that you know the military. That's kind of what you learn. And you learn to be a, you know, a thoughtful person or you're, you're expected to be, but, but you're in charge and you're command and control. Your ego is best suited, you know, is best burnished that way and, and whatnot. So for much of my career, I was completely that. I started moving much toward decentralized and toward a gardener's approach uh, later when I found that that is what worked better. It was faster, it built trust, it built relationships, it maintained relationships. There's nothing more powerful than looking at somebody who works for you and they come and they say, sir, we've got X and X. And just look at them and say, can you handle it? I trust you. And inside they kind of go, wow, he trusts me to handle it. Now they may not think they can handle it, but they're not gonna say that. They're gonna walk out going, he trusts me. And I found that's just really powerful. So. When I came upon the idea that what the leader is really doing is creating the environment in which this organization can operate, which you negotiate constantly, you're Mm -hmm. constantly sharing information, the leader can and sort of must set the rules and be the the lifeguard around the swimming pool because you've got to keep people talking. When you see bad behavior, you got to reach in and, and intervene. You got to make it safe. That's a very popular term now to do that. But the le- that's what the leader does. And that that is then best if the leader doesn't reach in and mess with the details. Yeah. But they can still watch. We call it eyes on, hands off. You know, you can yeah. watch it. You don't have to let everything go bad. Right. So you've created the environment. You've planted the seed. You offer the the enabling conditions um, exactly. and, and then um, 
the empowered leaders do their work. I've noticed that you're using the word equities in a particular way, and I think it might confuse some of the people that will watch this. So if you could just talk about how you're using equities, that phrase, please. Yeah, and, and that's a good point because it, it's a pretty broad term. I use it in the term of people thinking what's important to the organization. An organization's equities in my world might have been its standing in the counter-terrorist community or the amount of resources that it's given. Those things which make it special affect its standing. Distinctive and then, competencies, assets. Okay, got it. Got yeah. it. That's, that's helpful. So, so you, you know, it, those things that matter to you. Right. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. So... You've been in the private sector now since 2010, 2011? Yes, ma'am. 10 years. Yeah. So what, if anything, has changed about um, your thinking about leadership, especially in complex adaptive systems, and especially in light of just the... Um, just the incredible volatility that we, and, and turmoil that we find ourselves in um, as a country. Yeah, well, that's a great question. The first is that uh, in the civilian world, leaders have much more power than military leaders do. And that surprises people because you say life and death. Well, that's on the battlefield. In everything but actual combat, there are laws, regulation, habits, structures. I mean, it's a bureaucracy that is just, it's uh, crushing. And so military leaders for much of their career, most of the time are really constrained. They can't change their budgets. They, I mean, their, their ability to change things is tiny. Mm -hmm. They can shine up what they've got in accordance with established doctrine. You get in the civilian world, a CEO in many companies has got pretty open feel. They can turn 90 degrees on a dime if they've got a good place to go and if the board, if they're private, they don't need it, but if the board nods. So in reality, they've got far greater ability to operate and do it quickly and decide. There are some really good ones, but most or, or many um, struggle with the idea that they have that much ability to change. It's never gonna be exactly clear how you should change until after the fact and you usually are way late at doing the, taking the steps you need to make because there's a certain amount of trepidation and people will try to, to get perfect information and mitigate the risk to zero, but then that's sort of after the opportunity has come and gone. Where are the kind of leaders that we need being produced right now? Um, yes, courageous. Yes, people who are able to inspire this tremendous sense of shared purpose, but also people who have the system savviness. Like, where do we find them? Or how, like, where are the opportunities to shape them? They're not found in a single place. I go out to, to Silicon Valley and see tech startups. And as soon as they get big, they're just big companies. They got all the same problems. So there's not a, nothing in the water that makes one geographic area better. Um, there are many places where the the incentives are so misaligned that people work against the good of the organization for personal gain and, and they don't even know they're doing it they just they are um, i see very few companies investing the resources in leader training other than putting people in jobs in, in which case they learn by uh, experience the best places i've seen are places where you and it varies across uh, industries, but organizations where leaders have been moved into jobs and given the freedom to make a bunch of decisions and, and they learn from multiple experiences as in they go. It's much more serendipitous than it is thoughtful and intentional, which I think is unfortunate because we could get a lot more leaders to a higher level if we were more intentional and put the time and effort into it, but, but that's an investment. I, I have a question about something that is uh, an obsession uh, in our field: measurement. So, in, in your work, in your in your work, uh, you you kind of like definitely had a clear goal, clear vision of tomorrow to to kind of like dismantle this terrorist organization or to win the war. Um, but how along, along the way, how did you measure that you're tracking progress? Because 
in many of the work that we do with many hospital systems, they, there's always this question, oh, we wanna do this interdependence, complex adaptive systems work, but we need to measure it. We need to have specific measures that we will know exactly that we are tracking progress like we used to do um, in, um, in, a, in a hospital environment, or if you're a doctor, you're obsessed with that. So how was your relationship with measures and what did you do about that? I'm a great believer in measurements, but we didn't do well in it at all. Mm. What we found was we're trying to measure progress, outcome progress on our ability to defeat the enemy, which meant we had to know a tremendous amount about the enemy because that's what you're trying to measure, their relative strength or weakness. And that was hard. We also found that every time we acted on the enemy, we changed them. And so the knowledge we had was now changed. It's a, it's a moving target. Uh, Heisenberg principle, I guess it applies. Mm -hmm. But so that was a big problem. And so we ended up using mostly intuition and output mechanisms. Yes. Like we did learn that if we did a certain number of operations against the enemy, that had an effect. We couldn't draw the line perfectly because mm -hmm. it wasn't a perfect line. But mm -hmm. we did learn that if we were able to do certain things and output well, we'd get an outcome in a range. Ultimate, like a trajectory, right? A trajectory towards an outcome. And what's really critical about what you just said is that you didn't wait to have the perfect measure to take the action, right? Yeah. You were yeah. willing to deal with a set of proxies that you, that you knew were gonna point you in that, in, along the trajectory of your North Star goal. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, and the fact that the, the 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 you're you're actually working with a moving target, like that that you cannot, and that even the, your intervention, and that's a big problem in 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 the work that that hospital systems are doing in communities, is that communities are uh, this vibrant thing that is constantly changing, and even if you do one thing, it will change the 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 you know the the relationships in the community, and you can never be so certain about certain things, uh, certain measures that that you can follow. That is really, I'm so glad that you, you said that yeah. after because that's, yeah. that's a thing yeah. that we no struggle with a lot. Cause and effect. No yeah. linear cause and effect in complex adaptive systems. This has been so interesting. Another obsession in, in healthcare right now. And, and it was really interesting right. in COVID crisis, what happened was this, the reason why, we, why, why hospitals didn't have uh, you know, protection equipment was the fact that they were obsessed with efficiency and the stocks were so low and kind of like everybody was trying to keep like just the minimum, you know, and, and there's a problem with that when you have an unexpected enemy or, or a, something that is really not, not, you know, not certain. So I don't know, I, can you speak a little bit about that shift, both mentally and emotionally, even for you personally, that shift from efficiency to, to something else, whatever that else is. So. Sure, on, on two levels. The first is when people say, well, efficiency is used to be good, now it's not good. That's not true either. Because if you've taken one more step in efficiency and you said, if all of the hospitals had been linked and everybody had really good inventory management and we'd been smart and willing, we could have moved stocks to where they were needed and then we could have kept moving them. And the problem would have been a bit less than it was because mm -hmm. there was an awful lot of stocks being kept because people had theirs which is inefficient, it's also ineffective. But you're right, what we had to get was, we had a batting average mentality. We said that we only wanna go do something if there's a high probability of success because you don't wanna do an operation if it's not gonna succeed. The problem is our outcome was effect on the enemy, decreasing the enemy, which meant that it didn't matter if we did a hundred operations, what mattered was how many were successful against the enemy. So if we did 10 operations and nine were successful. You say, well, we're 90%, we're great. But if we do 50 operations and 11 are successful, your percentage is way down, but 11 is more than nine. And your outcome is the effect on the enemy. And so we found we had to get our minds in a different place to get there because they viewed every failure as a failure. And I said, every failure is not a failure. You know, it's, it's swinging at the pitch. We got to get, you know, we're never going to hit the ball unless we do. So we had to change the mindset about failure. We had to change the mindset about how we measure success. And I kept saying it only matters the outcome we're having on the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think health, if we could get to healthcare and we say, the only thing that matters is how healthy the population is. And as Ella correctly said, there aren't straight lines. If, if the population starts getting more healthy because you're doing better preschool and kids are learning, right. you know, learning better things, nor do you really care. I mean, yeah. if, at the end of the day, you just want this. Um, and that's the, that's this complex adaptive thing where you got to keep adjusting it, kind of keep looking at it, but understand right. there are connections. Right. And we're really trying to do it without that deep grounded shared purpose, right? Because we all agree that we're, we're, we're in this middle place, this liminal place right. of uh, a place where there's still this massive mismatch. And we're trying to, we're trying to give birth to this new thing. We're trying to move this, into this new reality, which is where we've been now. So. Suppose you had one KPI, health of the community, and measure yeah. it by length of life or, or you know, quality yeah. of life, whatever. And everybody had stock in that, all the players, and they were all compensated directly to that and that alone. Be very interesting difference. Our job would be done. <laughs> <laughs> which is I which is not a bad thing. Those just, other yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. Which is not a bad I mean, thing at all. That's where that's society our North has Star, to get. right there. That's it. Yeah. We, you know, we as a health foundation, we could address, you know, our stated goals of, you know, women's health, care of elderly, maintenance of US hospitals, but you know, we're not going to get any of that done unless we start to think about this other stuff and right. and we really are about the work of really trying to figure out how communities align understanding that national policy is sort of a lost opportunity for us right now it's just mm -hmm. we're just not in that place mm -hmm. but maybe right. we'll get there sometimes we are honestly stan we are afraid that we from our perspective pushing some of the leaders that we are working with um, into frontiers where their positions their jobs their their kind of like you know, their, their universes can be under threat because of that. And we, we are trying to be really empathetic towards that and be really careful with our advices and, 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 and the things that we say or suggest. I'm wondering about where the, where the moments, where, where, did you experience those moments yourself or did you see it in other colleagues because you were doing something completely new the answer is yes. I mean, I was very aware that I was pushing against the grain in many ways and I was frustrating people above me and, and things like that, creating a certain amount of resentment. But what happened was as we started to make progress and it took you know probably a year before people started looking at the command and say, wait a minute, we are getting a much different outcome than we used to and it's much better and it's essential. Mm -hmm. Then you started to have this building momentum. So probably for the first year or two of my command, in that particular command, um, there was this sense of, you know, I'm pushing and this is bold new world. Mm -hmm. But we're in a fight and, and I just can't stand to lose. So, you know, it yeah. didn't obsess me. It just, you know. Yeah. But then after a certain point, everybody started to say, hey, you guys are really going in the right direction. And then it got easy. Yeah. easier because other elements wanted to hook on they said i don't know why it works but it does work so that's right we'll be, we'll be part of this so so there there was an importance of that first win taking the system to the adjacent possible uh as the complex system adaptive uh, couple of the complex adaptive system things would say uh as a way to solidify the the direction that's absolutely right. absolutely okay. I have no further questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was, this was such a joy world. in many ways. Yeah, we'd be across the table from you. And uh, this is a real, yeah, I mean, you know, I, yeah, I'm just naming This was super fun for me. I really liked my job today a lot. So right. thank you. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. And I really admire what you're doing. Um, I mean, we've been we'll working. We'll go where angels dare to tread. Yeah. I mean, it, it's so self-evident to people that what you're doing is where it has to go. Yeah. And, and you, yeah, you just and want... there's not a lot of how to get there, right? There's not a lot yeah. of how to get there. And that's what we're, we're trying to sort out. So yeah. the fact that we have your example, that we really have scoured for a good example and found you and found yours is, 
it has been really helpful and, and, and great for us. So we really look forward to the learning partnership that we're hoping to cement with Chris. And uh, yeah, we're just really, really thrilled. So thank you, Stan. Well, thank, really you. thank you. And you guys have a great day.